If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. I want to remind you that uh, chapter 9, 10, and 11 have to do with deal with the nation of Israel as a whole, not people as individuals. And Paul just kind of stuck this right in the middle of Romans. He gave the gospel and talked about that, but he had to stop and explain this because his audiences were full of Jew, Jewish leaders <coughs> that rejected Jesus as the Messiah. And he just could not get it over to them that they think they are righteous because of what they have on or who they are or how much of the law they knew. And they were lost, and he told them straight up, you know, if you don't trust in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation, you are not going to heaven. I mean, that's how blunt he was earlier. And so here in the second part of chapter 11, he hits on kind of uh, the patriarchs, uh, kind of Israel in general, and then he speaks of the future of Israel also. And that's why I came up with this title, Israel's Rejection uh, is Not Final. It's not final. If you have a bulletin and you want to look at an outline, number one, Paul's ministry to the Gentiles. He always went to a city on his mission trips. He always started in the Jewish synagogues. But many times, uh, he was not just debated there. He was thrown out. He was thrown out of synagogues. He was thrown out of towns because of his walk with Jesus Christ. Number two, God's ministry to the Jews. God is not through with the Jews. He's just kind of put them on hold for right now. And then number three, God's future plan for Israel. And I want to try to, and this is my goal, is to breeze through the first two because the last point is so, so exciting. You know, in our focal scripture today, Paul is continuing his teaching that God has brought salvation to the Gentiles but has not uh, forsaken his chosen people, the Israelites. Paul had been refuting the thoughts that many of the Jewish leaders believed to be true, such as ritualism, legalism, the keeping of the law, is salvation, and for the Gentiles to become uh, like, uh, needed to become like Jews to be saved. We all have learned from the book of Romans that Jews and Gentiles are saved by faith in Jesus Christ and trusted in Christ alone for their salvation. Paul once again begins our text with a rhetorical question. Paraphrased, if God's chosen people have rejected Jesus Christ as the Messiah and God's only begotten Son, is there any chance for them to repent in the future and be saved? Praise God, his word tells us, it is never too late to become a Christian. And we know this is true because Jesus himself uh, Basically, because of his life, when he was on the cross, a man dying, one of the, one of the men dying, uh, accepted Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, on his deathbed, on this man's deathbed, today you will be with me in paradise. So let's look at Romans chapter 11, verse 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. And again, stumbled... Uh, is a word not meaning that you can lose your salvation, okay? They stumbled over the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They stumbled over who Jesus was, the perfect Son of God, and certainly not, okay? And you have to understand the background which Paul is coming from. He's coming from a Jewish background because of who he was. And if you think about it, I was thinking about this yesterday, if you look at the Jewish nation as a whole, for 1,400 years, they were the way to salvation. All the Old Testament, it, 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 it was about a coming Messiah. And when Paul is teaching this, Jesus has already come. Jesus was with them. They rejected Jesus himself, saw his miracles, knew who he was, and knew that he claimed to be the Son of God, which he was but yet they still rejected him as the Messiah. So it's one of those things on how can you not see this? 
It's like Judas. Judas spent three years with Jesus, but still never made Jesus Lord of his life. And Jesus even said about him, you know, that, uh, that he just regret the day that he was born. Why? Because we know he didn't know Jesus Christ. He went out and hung himself. And it's not because, and I know some religions believe that if you commit suicide, you'll go to hell. But folks, I am telling you, that's not it. He never trusted in Jesus Christ alone for his salvation. But, look what it says, through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. And a Jew would not and, and really did not believe that the Gentiles could be saved. They were not part of the chosen. They did not go to the rituals that they had of circumcision and, and uh, you know, memorization of the law and all these things. They really called them sometime Gentile dogs. They disrespected them so much. And even Peter had a problem, if you remember, in Acts chapter 10. He just said the that, that sheep come down with the, what, you know, they say, uh, you know, ceremonially unclean meat came. And I am so glad God says, listen, what I cleanse, I cleanse. I love bacon, all right? I love pork chops, all right? I would not have made a good Jew, all right? But even at that, they would not acknowledge who Jesus was. And, and Paul was just getting on to them again saying, you guys don't get it. And then it says in verse 12, now if their fall is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. And you have to remember, with this riches here came the day of Pentecost, the day when the Holy Spirit came down and 3,000 people were saved. Before, you had to have faith and believe in a coming Messiah. And folks, it took great faith to believe that. But now we can look back at the cross that has already happened, and even in our own conversion experience, the Holy Spirit has come inside of us. We know that. And that's what Paul was trying to say. You guys are still living in the Old Testament. It is the Holy Spirit. That is the sign that the Gentiles were saved. For I speak to uh, you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles. It's kind of like what Jesus said. You know, when you go and you witness to somebody and they reject you and they're rude about it and all that, he said, just dust your feet off. Don't take it personally. Go to the next house. There are people that want to know the truth about the Word of God. And he says, I magnify my ministry if by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are of my flesh and save some of them. Now, when we use the word jealousy, we always use it in a negative connotation. But what Paul really is saying is that he wants to live his life so that people see a difference in his life, and that difference is the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. Why do you do what you do? It's the Holy Spirit. Who convicts you of your sin? It's the Holy Spirit. And what he is saying is, I want to live my life so that when people see my life, they want what I have. They want my Jesus. And again, I'm not saying my personally, but we all that are saved have Jesus Christ in our lives. And that's what he was saying. He wasn't, he, he just said, you know, to, bro, to provoke them to jealousy that they may listen to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 15, for if uh, being uh, cast away is the reconciling of the world. What will their acceptance be but the life from the dead? And again, folks, when it says cast away, it doesn't mean the rejection is final, okay? It simply means right now, and I'll explain that uh, here at the end of the service. But he's just saying right now at this time, Jesus has already come. Pentecost had already come. The New Testament church had been born. Paul planted all these churches so that the gospel of Christ would go throughout that region. And they were there. Some of those fit folks were at the cross, 
They were the ones that crucified. I understand the Romans did it by law, but they were the ones that said, crucify him. So Paul says, okay, you won't listen to me. You, you don't do what the word says. I'm moving on to the Gentiles. Ephesians chapter 2. Go there for me if you would. Ephesians 2, verse 11. Therefore, remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands. And again, the difference between the Jew and the Gentile at that time was circumcision. Okay, circumcision, that was a huge thing there. And at that time, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of the promise, having no hope without God in the world. They didn't have and didn't know the commandments. They didn't have a written copy of the word of God. We're talking about the Gentiles. They did not understand the feast. They did not understand the history of Israel. They did not understand, you know, the laws and all that the laws entailed. And they were just pretty much in the dark about these things. Verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of of Christ. Oh, folks, I'm telling you, it is the blood of Christ that paid for our sins. We can have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And my friend, I am telling you, if you are here and you don't know Christ, you are missing something very, very special. It's that promise. It's that security. It's that, uh, you know, uh, knowing and knowing that when you die, you go to heaven. And then he says in verse 14, for he himself is our peace. Folks, what's missing in our world today is peace. Is peace. And again, I understand world peace, and I'm all for that. But folks, you can't have world peace unless you know the peace of God that passes all understanding. His title, one of his titles, was the Prince of Peace. When you don't have peace within, then you have war without. And it says, and has broken down the middle wall of separation. The Gentiles could not go into their temple. They could not go in there. They were not welcomed there. And you remember when Jesus arose from the dead, the veil of the temple was torn in two. He broke down the walls. He was saying, Jesus Christ is for everyone. And folks, we need to understand, I don't care what the color of your skin is. I don't care what you make. I don't care what you drive. I don't care who you are. I don't care what country you are from. Everyone, everywhere needs Jesus Christ. That wall has, has been broken down. Having abolished in his flesh the intimate, intimate enmity that the law of commandments contained in ordinance, so as created in himself one new man from two, thus making peace. Oh, folks, you got God the Father who created you. You got God the Son who gave his life for you. You have the Holy Spirit that is inside of you, and that Holy Spirit is what gives us peace, that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. What is he saying? It's Jew and Gentile. Back in those days, that was basically it. You were either a Jew or a Gentile. And today, it is anyone. It doesn't matter what nationality you are. And then verse 17, And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near, for through him we both have access to one spirit to the Father. Oh, folks, I am telling you, he was a minister to the Gentiles, but I am telling you, Jesus died for everyone. He died for everyone. The second thing I want you to see, not only Paul's ministries to the Gentiles, but God's ministry to the Jews. Look at our text in verse 16. For if the first fruits is holy, the, the lump is also holy. And again, he's drawing from the Old Testament 
where, and he's talking about literal, little, literally bread dough. And when they first came into the land, he said, your first fruits are always supposed to be given to the Lord. And in this particular instance, the ladies would make the bread and take a lump out uh, uh, for one loaf, and the first thing they would do is they would bake it and they would give it to the priest. And it was symbolic of that blessing on the bread. Okay, the blessing. They got the first fruits, and then it blessed the whole, uh, the whole dough. It, all of it was blessed is what it was symbolic of. And then it says, and if the root is holy, so are the branches. Now, what is he talking about the root? Folks, he's talking those patriarchs. He's talking Old Testament, Abraham, the promise that he made in Genesis chapter 12. You're going to be my people. I am going to bless you. I'm going to give you your own land. And folks, I'm telling you now, the land, you know, it's been taken away and been taken away, and it is a small, small land. And I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'm going to say it anyway. One day, Jesus is going to rule from Jerusalem, and he will conquer, and he will have all the land for him and his people during the millennium period. Verse 17, and if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive tree were grafted among them, with them became the partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree. And the symbolism here is the olive tree is Israel. And we know what uh, grafting is. When you take off a piece, and there's basically three ways you can do that. I don't have time to go, go into that. But basically you graft. For instance, the wild uh, olive tree doesn't produce fruit. Okay, It survives better than the olive tree that has fruit. So the grafting process basically makes that even stronger. It'll be stronger. It'll thrive more, plus it will give fruit. And what the symbolism is, is the, the, the roots are, you know, the Old Testament, the roots are Abraham and the promise made to God. The branches were the Jews for 1,400 years. It was a Jewish Old Testament thing. And now the Gentiles are coming in, and he is grafting them into what we call the church the church. So it says now, verse 18, do not boast again of the branches. If you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. And it goes both ways. It goes both ways with it. He was saying the Jews don't need to brag about who they are and that they might be the only ones going to heaven because we know that's not true. And then the Gentiles can't brag about, well, hey, God has chosen us now, so we don't have to you know, follow your law. We don't have to do these things. He's, he's, he's basically saying both, both the Jew and the Gentile have been made right with God. And again, not as a nation, not, not as a whole, but he's simply saying they can now both coexist and come under the umbrella of salvation. And folks, we know the root uh, is, is so important to any tree that thrives. Now look at verse 19. You will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. And folks, if you look at the Old Testament, Israel would do good for a while, they'd do good for a while, and then, man, he would chastise them, he would discipline them, and they would be down and out for a while. But again, even when branch, some branches are taken off, the tree is still alive, okay? It's not that he has forsaken them. He has just put them on hold because of what they believe. Verse 20, well said, because of unbelief they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fail, severity, but to you, goodness. If you continue in the goodness. And the bottom line is, folks, he disciplines everyone. I mean, there, there is discipline to uh, his children, his children, and, and there's severity there also, but he doesn't. The difference is he doesn't hold a grudge. Once the punishment is done, it's over with him. He doesn't set them aside. He doesn't say you're not important. 
And bottom line, folks, we all mess up. We are all sinners. We all need the mercy of God. It's just there at times that we are, it's not that we are cut off and we are no longer saved. It's simply saying that discipline, okay, we are not in direct contact there, okay? And it says in verse 23, and they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. And I can think of the prodigal son. Folks, you can think of a lot of instances in the Word of God where somebody was saved and somebody was a Christian and they just strayed from God. And folks, I am telling you, God wants you to come home. God wants you to come back. God wants you to have a personal relationship with Him. Verse 24, for if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated tree, how much more will these who are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? You know the word he really is trying to get across here? We are all under God's grace. All of us. God's riches at God's it, at God's expense, God's riches at Christ's expense, excuse me. And folks, we can't, we don't need to judge people. We don't need, God never throws anyone away. God never gives up on anyone. Grace and mercy is always there for us. And in Galatians 2, Galatians 2, verse 15, I want you to see this. Galatians 2, 15. I like to hear them pages turning. Galatians 2, 15. We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of Gentiles, uh, knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. In the Jews, that's what they tried to do. That's what the leaders tried to do. Be religious. Folks, you don't need religion. You need righteousness. You need the righteousness of God in your life. And matter of fact, if you don't have Christ, I'm telling you, you can't be a, a Christian. You can't not give up this stuff. And, and you can't change. The, the God it, through the Holy Spirit changes you. Verse 17, but if while we seek to be justified by Christ, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, died to the law that I might live to God. Man, you can try and you can try and you can try. But folks, you can't live up. There's only two ways to get to heaven. One is perfection, and that's exactly how Jesus did it. He was the perfect Son of God. And then the other way is through the blood of Jesus Christ. And in verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And I do not set aside the grace of God. Folks, when we mess up, when we sin as Christians, 1 John 1, 9 says that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. For uh, I, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. And folks, we know Christ did not die in vain. We are saved by faith and by Grace. So we see Paul's ministry to the Gentiles. We see God's ministry to the Jews. He is not forsaking them. He is not. He is giving them grace. He is giving them mercy. And let's look at God's future plan for Israel. Look at verse 25. For I, for I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion that blindness in part has happened to Israel and to the fullness of the Gentiles have come in. Folks, if you tried to explain Revelation 
on your own, I'm telling you, it, it's a mystery. People look at Revelation. Most people don't even understand Revelations. It, they just don't. And, and we don't need to try to figure everything out. You know, God is the one that knows everything. He knows when he's coming. He, he knows when the last person is going to be saved. He knows who that person is. By the way, you know what today is? Anybody know? The Festival of the Trumpets? Today, there are people that believe today, at sundown, Jesus Christ is coming. Now, you know what I say to that? Come on, baby. <laughs> Just come on. And if that puts fear in you, you don't have confidence in your salvation experience. I am not saying he's coming today because somebody else had to remind me of that. I didn't come up with that on my own. But it is a possibility, folks. Study it. Then it says, until the fullness of the Gentiles have come. 1,400 years, it was the Jews. Man, Jesus came, everything changed, and since then, we are living in the day of the Gentiles. And when that last Gentile gets saved, folks, when that last lost person gets saved, that's when the rapture of the church will occur. And so Israel will be saved, as it is written, and all of Israel will be saved. Folks, he is not saying that everyone in Israel will be saved because it's still an individual decision. That's when the restoration of Israel begins. That's the restoration. And look what it says, the deliverance. Again, Isaiah 59, if you want to look it up in the Old Testament. Really, you need to read chapter 59 and chapter 60 if you want to know this whole story. The deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but concerning election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. Folks, I'm telling you, that's what election is. That's what predestination is. God already knows, I believe. You know, man has a choice. And again, we've talked about that, and, and it's hard. In our finite minds, it's hard to understand how those two coexist, but they coexist. Verse 29, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. You're not going to stop it. God's going to reign. God, I'm just telling you, it's going to happen. You, he, his promises are true. His word is true. Verse 30, for as you once disobeyed, once disobedient to God, yet now you have attained mercy through their disobedience. Even so, these also have now been disobedient, that though the mercy shown to you may also obtain mercy. Folks, we are all, four times he speaks about mercy. We are all under the mercy of God, the mercy of God. For God has committed them to all disobedience that he might have mercy on them all. He doesn't have favorites. God doesn't. Oh, the depths of the riches of both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Now, this last four verses, I'm telling you, we don't have time to cover it like I want to. You go home and you read these and you, you ponder, you meditate on these verses. Oh, the depth of the riches of both the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his past, his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has become his counselor? Or who has first given to him? And it shall be repaid to him. And again, he was simply saying, uh, you know, the fullness of the Gentiles has not come yet. So his mercy is still pending. It is still out there. There are still people that need to be saved. And again, I want to just fast forward, folks. Uh, we don't have time to give you a revelation lesson, but the time that he is speaking of where uh, Israel will be fully restored is during the millennium period. During the millennium period. And folks, I am telling you, uh, it is going to be, remember Satan bound? That alone should ought to make you want to be there, all right? No more Satan. He is bound. Uh, I understand we've got to go through the tribulations. 
I don't know where you stand in the tribulation, all right, but I believe the rapture of the church will start all of that, and then Jesus will come back with his folks, okay, and the battle of Armageddon will happen, and he will destroy the enemy and throw Satan into hell, and that's where the restoration of Israel is. Now look at the last verse. For of him and through him, and to him are all things. Now, I read that too fast. For of him, and through him, and to him are all things. What does that consist of? Everything. Everything surrounds God. Everything depends on God. Everything, everything that you see in even the spiritual world to whom be glory forever and amen. Revelation, go to me with Revelation. I love this. Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. Revelation 5, 8, and I close with this. Now when he had taken the scroll and the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints, and they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Now look at this. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, there are still people in America and in this world that need Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And folks, we will all be in heaven with these sanctified saints singing and praising and worshiping God, our Savior, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard a voice of many angels around the throne, living creatures and elders, and the number of them were 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And God is worthy of our praise. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard them saying, blessings and honor and glory and power to be to him who sits on the throne, to the Lamb forever and ever. And then the foreign living creature said, Amen. The 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. Folks, it's coming. It is coming. Are you ready for the rapture of the church? Jesus died for every one of you. Jesus spilt his blood for every one of you. Do you know that if you were to die today, you would go to heaven. Folks, this is why we give an invitation. There are so many people, so many churches now, don't even give an altar call. And folks, I believe in an altar call because that's exactly what Peter did on the day of Pentecost. So if you need Jesus Christ, just come down to one of us and say, hey, you know what, Brother Mike, I need to be saved. I want to be in that number. And then to the Christian, Folks, there's still work to be done. There's still work to be done. In just a few weeks, Scott is going to start a class, Witnessing Without Fear. And I would encourage many of you to get in that class. Do you realize, not just by taking that class, but when we win somebody to Christ, we're getting uh, the rapture of the church even closer to us? Have you ever thought of it that way? You are actually speeding up the end of the world as we know it because another person got saved. And not only that, the angels in heaven rejoice and that person rejoices. And I don't know, it's one of the best feelings in the world when you are able to win somebody to Jesus Christ knowing that their sins are forgiven and that they will live with God forever in a perfect place called heaven. Father, thank you for your word and God, I know we covered a lot of ground today. And God, I pray we don't get lost in uh, however many verses it was. God, I pray that we would just understand 
that Christ died for everyone. Jews are the chosen people. They will be restored. But God, we're all going to be in heaven together, and we're all going to be praising you. But God, we still have a job to do. And God, I pray that you would just convict us, Lord, convict us where we fall short. And God, I pray that we would be men and women of prayer, that we would pray for divine appointments, and that we would uh, take this course and just learn how to lead someone to Jesus Christ. God, I truly believe we don't have that much time left. So God, if there's one here that doesn't know you, I pray today would be their day of salvation. God, bless this time of invitation. If others need to come forward for baptism or rededicating their life, or even joining the church, God, I pray that the Holy Spirit would impress on them. God, it's your church. This is your church. This is your time. God, you use it for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you, will you come?